Okay, so today is a great pleasure to have uh, Daniel Stern uh, from University of Chicago uh, at uh, the PD seminar, um, and this is uh, also joined with uh, uh, the informal geometric analysis seminar uh, that uh, will uh, talk about. We talk to us how to produce uh, minimal submanifolds via gauge theory. Okay, thank you, Daniel. The floor is yours. Take it over. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot to Antonio for the invitation. It's great to be uh, virtually in Maryland. So uh, yeah, so the basic objects we're going to be starting with today are minimal submanifolds. Okay, so let's say we're in some closed oriented Riemannian n-manifold, um, although a lot of the results we're talking about will be interesting even in local settings just for like domains in Rn, but uh, we'll start out here. And just recall that if we have a closed k-dimensional submanifold inside of m, uh, it's said to be minimal if it's a critical point for the k-dimensional volume functional, e.g. when we push it around by uh, isotopies. Right, and equivalently, this is telling us that the mean curvature vector vanishes. Okay, so a, a basic question, which goes back in some forms to the 1700s, uh, is uh, you know which n manifolds contain closed minimal submanifolds with dimension k? Okay, I guess probably need to go to the 19th century for the manifold formulation, but the uh, right question about existence of minimal surfaces goes back very far. All right, and so uh, okay, so if we're talking about geodesics. Uh, some other interesting case was first raised by Poincaré, where he asks which uh, metrics on the two sphere, for instance, contain closed geodesics. All right, so if we're trying to answer this question in generality, um, then we want some techniques for producing minimal submanifolds of a given dimension k inside an ambient manifold. Okay, so we want some general machinery. So ultimately, where I'm going today is for uh, a new machinery uh, in co dimension two for producing manifolds that are minimal submanifolds two dimensions lower than the uh, ambient manifold. But uh, of course, the oldest machinery, or at least the most uh, robust one introduced in the 20th century, is a geometric measure theory. Right? So if we're trying to produce critical points of some k-dimensional volume functional, then the natural thing to do is to try to do some kind of variational theory for the volume functional directly. Right? And the, the toolkit for doing this is geometric measure theory. OK, so uh, this won't be a GMT talk, but it's sort of lying under the skin of everything we do. So let's just uh, recall a few basics. All right, so if we're talking about existence results for geodesics or minimal surfaces, then uh, existence results go back to the beginning of the 20th century. But uh, a general existence theory for area minimizing K surfaces and N manifolds uh, doesn't really come up until the 1950s with the work of Federer and Fleming. So if we're trying to solve some kind of volume minimization problem, so for instance, if we're trying to minimize volume among uh, K surfaces with some fixed K minus one dimensional boundary or in some fixed uh, homology class, uh, and if we're trying to do this by direct methods, and what we want to do is be able to take uh, a sequence, a minimizing sequence of these guys for the volume, right, and extract a limit. Okay, but it's easy to see that we can't extract a limit if we're, uh, you know, imposing some strong topology like C1 or C0. Uh, so we need to begin with an appropriate weak notion of submanifold. Okay, so the, the first step here in, in Federer and Fleming's work is to observe that we can view k-dimensional submanifolds as uh, what are called k-currents. Right, so they're linear functionals on the space of K forms via integration. Okay, so this is just saying we can at least put them inside some giant space of distribution type objects. Okay. Um, okay, and in this space of distributions, we have a notion of boundary of these generalized submanifolds, right? Basically just by duality with Stokes theorem. And uh, moreover, the K area extends to a, a lower semi-continuous functional under weak convergence called the mass. Okay, so we have a notion of mass and boundary, so we can begin to make sense of these problems in this, this weaker setting. All right, but these currents uh, without any additional constraints are very, you know, uh, wild distributional objects. We want to refine our notion a little more. Okay, so one of the key insights of Federer and Fleming was that smooth submanifolds and integer combinations thereof uh, lie inside a distinguished subclass of currents uh, with nice compactness properties for solving uh, mass minimization problems by direct methods. And these are the integral currents. So we'll say a current T and M is integral if it's given by integration against some K rectifiable set with some integer multiplicity. Okay, so just to remind you, a K rectifiable set um, is something which looks like a patchwork of K dimensional C1 or Lipschitz submanifolds, right? Such that this uh, K dimensional tangent space is well-defined almost everywhere. So these really do look like singular K dimensional submanifolds uh, equipped with some integer multiplicity function. Okay, um, and for them to be integral, we also ask that their mass and the mass of their boundary are finite. So the observation of Federer and Fleming is that we have if we have uniform bounds on the mass and the mass of the boundary, then in fact, these are going to be uh, weakly compact, 
So if we take a limit, we'll end up with a, um, a limit that's also itself an integral case. And so using this, you can show, for instance, that uh, every non-trivial integer homology class uh, can be represented by a mass minimizing integral cycle. So in particular, if we have non-trivial k-dimensional homology in our manifold, then at least we know we can produce some kind of singular closed k-dimensional minimals of manifold by minimization. All right, but a priori, these can be quite singular. So we can ask how regular they might be. Right? All right, so if k is m minus one, so for one dimension lower than the ambient manifold, here's a classic series of results by DeGiorgi, uh, Federer, and Simons, which tells us that in fact, these are pretty regular. So mass minimizing m minus one current is gonna be given by a smooth hypersurface. So in particular, a smooth classically minimal hypersurface with constant multiplicity away from some singular set of dimension at most n minus eight. Okay, so that's pretty nice. In particular, in dimension seven and below, uh, they'll be smooth. All right, if on the other hand, k is between two and n minus two, then uh, we get a little weaker regularity. So the mass minimizing k current in this case in higher co-dimension is given by a smooth submanifold of constant multiplicity away from a singular set of dimension at most k minus two. So the singular set now can be up to two dimensions lower than the uh, minimal submanifold we're looking at. Okay. And it's important to note that that's sharp. So uh, there's a classic observation of Federer, which tells us that any, for instance, holomorphic subvariety, so any complex subvariety inside a Kähler manifold is going to minimize mass in its homology class that satisfies a special condition called being calibrated. So in particular, algebraic subvarieties inside CPN, for instance, uh, can have co-dimension two singular sets. And it's a useful example for two reasons. First of all, because it shows us this regularity result is sharp and provides the basis for a lot of the examples we look at when we're studying singularities. But second, because it shows us that uh, even when the minimal submanifolds we produce are singular, they can still be classically interesting objects like singular algebraic varieties. So we don't somehow throw them away just because they encounter singularities. Okay. All right, but now what if we're trying to produce uh, closed minimal case of manifolds when we have no homology? So we can't do these minimization problems. So can we still find some closed minimal submanifold of dimension k? Right? So for k equals one, if we're producing geodesics, then the uh, positive answers go back to Birkhoff, Kluzenich, Schneerlman, and Morse in the first half of the 20th century, where the idea is we can ex exploit some non-trivial topology in the space of loops, and then do some kind of Morse theory or min-max theory for an appropriate energy or length functional. All right. So the natural thing to try is to do the same thing for the general k-dimensional volume functional uh, in these geometric measure theory settings introduced by uh, Federer and Fleming. Okay. So to do this, we first need to know that uh, uh, some appropriate space of cycles has non-trivial topology. All right, so Federer assigned this problem to uh, a promising PhD student of his, Fred Almgren. And uh, fortunately, Almgren was able to show uh, that indeed the space of k-dimensional integral cycles inside an n-dimensional manifold has homotopy groups which correspond to the homology of the manifold. And uh, really the important point here is that uh, if M is oriented, well, then we know that the top dimensional homology is going to be uh, non-vanishing, right? We have a fundamental class. And so in particular, the n minus kth homotopy group of k-dimensional cycles uh, is non-vanishing, right? So we always have some n minus k parameter family of k cycles, which are somehow, you know, we can glue these together to sweep out the fundamental class, okay? So we have some non-trivial topology to play here. However, if we're trying to do uh, classical Morse or min-max methods, uh, the mass functional is only going to be a lower semi-continuous functional uh, on this very non-smooth space of k integral k cycles. Okay, so in particular, it's not really well suited to classical min-max techniques, where we'd want at least something like a C1 functional on some kind of Bonnach or Fensler manifold, right? Um, but Omgren was able to uh, make something work. So Omgren was able to develop some kind of discretized min-max theory uh, in the space of integral k cycles and get the following existent result. So he was able to show that uh, in the uh, early 60s, that every closed Riemannian manifold uh, supports a non-trivial stationary integral k verifold where k is between one and the dimension of the manifold. So uh, what are these objects? So an integral k verifold is locally these integral currents we were seeing before, except we're forgetting uh, orientation. Okay, so it's just, we can think of it as some measure given by integration over some k-rectifiable set uh, equipped with some uh, now positive integer multiplicity function. And then we call such a thing stationary uh, if it satisfies the obvious analog in the setting of being a critical point for the k-volume functional. So if it's a critical point for this weighted k-volume functional, we're integrating this multiplicity function over, over our k-surface um, when we push it around by diffeomorphisms of the manifold. 
Okay. So we have some kind of, of closed weak minimal uh, k-dimensional submanifold inside any ambient guy. But what do these actually look like? So how close are they in particular to being smooth closed minimal submanifolds? So by some uh, partial regularity results of Allard in the 70s, we know that any stationary integral variable, one of these guys, coincides with a smooth minimal submanifold on at least a dense open subset of its support. So if we choose some kind of bare generic point, then we know that in a neighborhood, we're going to look like a classical smooth minimal case of manifold. However, um, it's an open problem whether for a general uh, variable of this type, the regular set has, has even full k-dimensional measure. So it's possible that we choose a bare generic point uh, and get something regular, but we could choose a point which is you know, generic in the measure sense and uh, get something, uh, something irregular, some singular point. Um, so, uh, a priori, we don't know that much about the regularity of these guys, but at least they're a natural starting point for a notion of uh, a weak, closed, minimal case of manifold. On the other hand, if we're, okay, so if we're in general co-dimension, uh, that's basically the best we can say uh, about these min-max guys as well. However, in co-dimension one, we can say a bit more, um, following work of Pitts and Shane Simon in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. So combining the work of Pitts and Shane and Simon and you know, with contributions from Almgren as well, we know that if k is n minus one, it's at least two, right? So we're in the three manifold or higher and they're looking at hypersurfaces. Then the stationary hypersurfaces given by Almgren's min-max construction are going to be smoothly embedded minimal hypersurfaces, so classical objects, away from a singular set of dimension at most n minus eight, right? So the same kind of condition we were seeing for the minimizers before. And in particular, uh, they're smooth in dimension at most seven, okay? So in low dimensions, we get existence of classical smooth minimal hypersurfaces. And in higher dimensions, they satisfy sort of the best regularity we can hope for, knowing that uh, we have examples with, uh, uh, with co-dimension seven singular sets. Okay. So in the past uh, five or 10 years, uh, Marquez and Nevis have been building on this uh, min-max theory for hypersurfaces quite a bit. And together with work by Kay Erie, Evgeny Lokomovich, Antoine Song, Shinzhou, and a, a pile of other people, um, they've been able to refine these Almgren and Pitts results uh, to show that not only do min-max hypersurfaces exist in every uh, ambient manifold, but in fact, piles of them exist. So for instance, for a generic metric, um, you can show that the union of their supports forms a dense subset of your ambient manifold. So not only do they exist, but they're incredibly abundant. Right? There's been this uh, whole series of, series of uh, breakthroughs in the last uh, uh, decade or so. Okay. Around the same time, uh, a different program was initiated by uh, Marco Goraco in his thesis with various contributions by Pedro Gaspar, uh, Fritz Hiesmeyer, uh, Chodash and Mantulidis, and Kash um, where they're exploiting connections between minimal hypersurfaces and semilinear scalar elliptic equations to get a powerful regularization of the Omgren Pitts theory. And at the same time, get new results about these semilinear scalar equations, um, which they're using for their regularization. Okay, so what's the story there? All right. So these are the Allen Kahn equations. So a real valued function on our manifold solves this uh, Allen Kahn equation with small parameter epsilon, this guy here, if and only if it's a critical point of the so-called Allen Kahn energy. So E epsilon of U is this epsilon over two times Dirichlet term, plus this potential uh, weighted over epsilon, where the potential is uh, so-called double well, right? So a canonical example is something like W of T is one minus T squared squared. So something with a, a minimum, absolute minima at minus one plus one, and then giving us this W uh, interpolating between them, all right? So in particular, our absolute minimizers are just going to be constant functions to plus or minus one. But for a general map, we're, when we feed it through this, our potential term is gonna try to force us to take values close to minus one and plus one uh, almost everywhere, right? Where it does so more and more harshly as epsilon goes to zero. But that this Dirichlet term gives us some regularization and tells us we can't just sort of interpolate between minus one and plus one in an arbitrary way. There's some control over how we pass between those regions, okay? So in the 70s, following some observations of the Georgi, uh, Modica and Mortola observed that there's a, this intriguing relationship between the variational theory of these energies and that of the n minus one area functional, or equivalently the perimeter functional for Kajapolis sets, okay? So what they showed is that for any sequence uh, of W12 map functions with a uniform bound of these Allen Kahn energies, as epsilon goes to zero, 
they find that uh, by reparameterizing these functions in a natural way, uh, these uh, reparameterized guys are going to converge subsequently to some limit function of bounded variation, taking values in plus or minus one, uh, whose L1 norm of the gradient, or rather it's, you know, it's gradient's a radon measure, so the mass of that radon measure is going to be bounded above by uh, the limit of those uh, Allen con energies. So in particular, this BV function taking values in plus or minus one, that's just going to be the uh, function of the form chi omega minus the characteristic function of the complement of omega, right, for some domain omega of finite perimeter. And this is just telling us uh, that the, uh, the boundary area of that domain is bounded above uh, by these Allen con energies in the limit, right? And moreover, they show that any uh, set omega of finite perimeter can be approximated in this way with a quality holding in this limit. So this is telling us the Allen con energies so-called gamma converge the perimeter functional on n minus one boundaries. So this gamma convergence, I'm not gonna get into what that means, but it just is telling us that the, the minimization problems for these epsilon energies converge in a natural weak way to the minimization of n minus one area on these uh, Kachopoli sets. Okay. So in the decades since this interplay between the allen kahn equations and minimal hypersurfaces has been uh, the subject of a lot of research. Um, so there are lots and lots of results I won't talk about, but some of the highlights that are relevant for us. So in the, the beginning of this century, Hutchinson and Tonegawa showed that for any sequence of solutions, so now not arbitrary functions, but solutions of these allen kahn equations with a uniform energy bound, these energy measures right, are going to converge subsequently to some limit measure mu, which is given exactly by uh, the measure of a stationary integral n minus one variable. Okay, so in particular, uh, not only do the minimization problems converge, but any family of critical points for these, uh, this nice semi-linear elliptic equation, they're going to converge in some sense to, uh, to critical points of the n minus one area functional. Okay, Tonegawa and Wikrama Sekera were able to refine this and show that if we assume moreover that these functions are stable critical points, so they're uh, minimizing to second order, right? Then in fact, that limit sigma, that limit variable is going to be a smooth minimal hypersurface away from a set of dimension at most n minus eight. So they have that same regularity that we saw for minimizers and for the min-max guys from before, okay? So building on this, Goraco um, was able to show that sequence of solutions of these allen kahn equations arising from natural min-max constructions, well, now they won't be stable, but they'll have some uh, bounds on their Morse index as epsilon goes to zero. And so again, they're going to converge as epsilon goes to zero to minimal hypersurfaces of this optimal regularity. So singular set at most uh, co-dimension seven. And uh, building on this, he showed that uh, um, you can get an alternative to the omgren pitts construction of in max minimal hypersurfaces just via these nice uh, semi-linear scalar equations, right? And the idea is we can replace this awkward GMT min-max of Omgren, which again does not fit into sort of a classical min-max framework, and now do this uh, a really nice classical Morse theoretic methods for these smooth functionals on uh, just this Hilbert space of uh, Sobolev maps into R, right? And so in particular, it shifts all of the technical work of the GMT min-max construction onto just the asymptotic analysis of these uh, solutions of these equations as epsilon goes to zero. So it shifts all of this sort of awkward GMT work into just this nice sort of clean, albeit still uh, non-trivial PDE problem. Okay. All right, and that, there have now been uh, you know, many successes of this approach, uh, but one of the uh, biggest ones has been this proof by Chodosh and Mandulidis of the so-called multiplicity one conjecture in dimension three. So it's telling us that uh, for a generic three manifold, the minimal surfaces produced uh, by the min-max for Allen Kahn will come with the uh, multiplicity ones. That multiplicity function will just be the constant one, or right, this turns out to be really useful if you're interested in these problems about counting how many minimal surfaces are contained in a given manifold. Okay. It's not in the slide, but I should also mention there's a, a great deal of work going back to Ilmanen, uh, which tells us that in fact, the, the parabolic version of these equations is also a useful regularization of the uh, co-dimension one mean curvature flow. So in particular, if you're interested in producing mean curvature flows, it gives us a nice uh, way of producing long time weak solutions that uh, is difficult to do by direct methods. Okay. All right, so given all these applications, uh, a natural question we can ask is whether there's any similar phenomenon in higher co-dimension. So in particular, is there a sim similar dictionary between some natural family of geometric PDEs and minimal submanifolds of some co-dimension M bigger than one, right? And let me emphasize that uh, this natural here, 
because somehow we're not just looking for some nasty mollification of the area functional, we're really interested in finding one via some natural family of geometric PDEs so that we're also getting some interesting dictionary where we're getting uh, you know, a two-sided story where we get these guys, uh, you know, these PDEs regularizing the story for the area functional, but also then using uh, our knowledge of minimal submanifolds to get new information about these PDEs that we have some independent interest in. Right. Okay. Uh, right, so if so, then uh, we can hope this to improve our understanding of these min-max minimal submanifolds, but also then uh, uh, but at the same time, get interesting information about the solution space of these PDEs. So in co-dimension two, uh, the work I'm talking about today gives a, a positive answer, or at least the start of a positive answer. So there is a, a well-studied family of functionals arising in gauge theory, whose critical points, and it turns out the variational theory, limit to those of the mass functional on the space of uh, co-dimension two integral cycles, in particular the area functional of co-dimension two. Okay. So uh, before we get to the, the one that works, let's look at uh, uh, sort of another attempt people have made, including myself, in co-dimension two that falls slightly short, okay? So an early candidate that we could think about would be the non-gauged ginsburg landau functionals. So one family of functionals uh, which comes close to providing a positive answer are the so-called complex ginsburg landau energies. So formally, these look like the allen kahn energies, but now we're thinking about complex valued maps U, okay? And we're feeding into this energy which uh, assigns the Dirichlet energy plus this one over four epsilon squared one minus the norm of u squared squared. Okay, so uh, notice that if u is uh, an S1 valued map, so it's taking values in the unit circle in C, then this potential vanishes, and we're just recovering the Dirichlet energy. So if we're restricting to the space of S1 valued maps um, and doing minimization problems, for instance, then we end up just looking for harmonic maps to S1, okay? But if we have a map that's uh, taking values away from S1, this potential term is gonna penalize it, and it's going to penalize it with increasing severity as epsilon goes to zero. Okay. And sure enough, if we're in the bounded energy regime, uh, so if we're looking at uh, you know where these f epsilon are, are uh, bounded as epsilon goes to zero, then the variational theory for these f epsilon is really just going to approximate the variational theory uh, of the Dirichlet energy for S1 valued maps. And for instance, critical points at uniform energy bounds are just going to converge to harmonic S1 valued maps in the limits. These are just S1 valued maps which locally lift to harmonic functions. Okay. On the other hand, if we look at the O of log epsilon energy regime, which is where a lot of our, uh, we end up when we do natural variational problems, uh, then critical points can have non-trivial zero sets. And those zero sets, it turns out, are going to converge as epsilon goes to zero to some kind of generalized minimal varieties of co-dimension two. Okay. So there are uh, you know, a couple decades of results making that precise. Um, most of it sort of building on some early observations of Lennon Riviere in the 90s and uh, Bethuel, Brazil, and Orlandi in the early 2000s. But the punchline is that given a family of these critical points uh, with energy growing like log epsilon as epsilon goes to zero, then these normalized energy measures, so this Dirichlet term over log epsilon, are going to converge subsequently to some limit measure of the form mu v plus uh, norm h squared, uh, just this Lebesgue term, right? It's an absolutely continuous term where H is a harmonic one form. So we get the energy density of some harmonic one form. And this mu sub V is gonna be a stationary rectifiable N minus two variable supported on the limit of these zero sets. Okay, so let's clarify a few things. So if we're comparing with this uh, analogous results for Alan Kahn, right, we see uh, two clear drawbacks right away. So first this limiting energy can have this non-trivial diffuse part, right, given by the square norm of this harmonic one form. And that's related to the fact that Again, this energy is in some ways just trying to give us harmonic S1 valued maps. And it's possible these critical points uh, have some component which just look like harmonic maps that are uh, of an energy growing like log epsilon for sort of arbitrary uh, topological reasons. Okay. Um, a more serious drawback at the local level is that these, this N minus two dimensional part, this uh, generalized minimal submanifold, um, is only a stationary rectifiable varifold, not an integral varifold. So if we think back to our definition, that's just telling us that this density function theta uh, along our uh, n minus two rectifiable set can a priori take any positive real value. It doesn't have to be restricted to some uh, quantized set, okay? Which may seem like a technical point, but it actually has implications for the, the regularity theory um, and uh, also just for the size of the space of objects that we're considering. So for instance, in, uh, if uh, n is three, so these are just producing some kind of geodesic networks, um, the space of, uh, 
real geodesic, network, re geodesic networks with real coefficients uh, is much larger in a geometric sense than uh, Antonio, question? Yeah, just to be sure, Daniel, so um, yeah. on these two bullet points, so the first bullet point can happen uh, while the second bullet point is expected not to happen, right? So. Uh, yes, although I'm not sure how strong the expectation is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, what I mean is that it's just yeah. to be sure. So for the first one, this thing can really happen. So it's yeah. the second bullet point, it may be that. So it's. Yeah, people have conjecture that it should be integral. Um, but as we'll see, that lack of integrality um, is related to some deeper problems. So I'll maybe get to that in a minute and explain a bit more. OK? OK. OK, but anyway, so at, at least a priori, these guys could not necessarily be integral variables. I mean, it could be part of a much larger space with a different regularity theory. So, OK. So what, what's going wrong in the difference between this and this, uh, these co-dimension one things in the Allen Kahn setting? So with the, the cartoon picture for Allen Kahn, is the following, and I apologize for the quality of the cartoon. But uh, right, the idea is that, uh, OK, so as we're concentrating, so if we're in the scalar valued case, right, and our energy is concentrating along some uh, minimal submanifold, co-dimension one, then uh, as epsilon goes to 0, we expect the following picture. So we have our limiting hypersurface, which is just going to look like the 0 set uh, of, our, of our function. And what we find is that almost all of the energy is uh, concentrated in an epsilon neighborhood or an O of epsilon neighborhood of that zero set and uh, vanishing rapidly outside. Okay, and outside our function is just gonna look like, you know, taking values plus one on one side and taking values minus one on the other. So the whole party is happening uh, in this O of epsilon neighborhood. And uh, okay, when we rescale the epsilon size to unit size, we're just getting model solutions in Rn of the equation with parameter epsilon equals one. Okay, so everything is happening on the epsilon scale when we blow up to unit size, we're getting model solutions. And somehow the reason uh, uh, we can characterize these well is if we blow up sort of at a generic point along that zero set, we're getting not just an arbitrary model solution, but model solutions which are going to look really just one dimension. Okay, and that's somehow the, the basis for this Allen Kahn picture. If we're looking at the complex Ginsburg Landau picture, um, so let's say we're concentrating on this co dimension two set, and we're looking now at some two dimensional slice uh, perpendicular to it. Okay. So what's happening? So what, let's say we have some zeros, some z1 through zk in that two-dimensional slice. So away from an epsilon neighborhood of those zeros, now instead of being some trivial object, like a constant function to plus or minus one, we're going to look like a harmonic S1 valued map. Right? So say something like uh, you know, z minus cj, the product of these z minus cj is to some degree. Right? So we have these zeros, and they're occurring with some integer degrees kappa 1 through kappa k. Okay? And it turns out that that log epsilon energy, the dominant energy contribution, is not coming from this epsilon neighborhood around the zero sets, where we can blow up and again see some kind of model solutions. It's coming from these annular regions outside. So all of that energy is coming from these regions where distance to the zero set is not the, like O of epsilon, but looks like some small power of epsilon. Okay. And uh, using this, you can compute that if we're choosing this two dimensional slice sort of generically, then the density of that slice. Uh, is going to look like the sum uh, from one decay of those multiplicities squared plus this Coulomb interaction term where we sum over distinct pairs of zeros, the product of their, uh, of their degrees, their winding numbers, right, together with this logarithmic interaction term, so this log of the distance between them over log epsilon. Okay, so uh, Antonio, to your question, um, the, the key to showing that uh, these densities are indeed uh, integral comes in ruling out this kind of interaction term, OK? So for minimizing solutions, you can do that because basically these zeros are going to be sufficiently far apart that this, uh, this log zi minus zj is going to be uh, negligible compared to log epsilon. In two dimensions, there is some special work by uh, Comte and Miranescu, which tells you that you can somehow uh, rule it out by some uh, careful use of magical Pohjaev identities that uh, break down completely uh, once you go to higher dimension. So the problem with ruling out integrality and in, uh, which establishing integrality in higher dimension is trying to rule this out in the higher dimensional picture, which is uh, a difficult, interesting question. Notice though that even if uh, we have integrality, so even if we can rule out uh, these interaction terms, it's still the case that this isn't really giving us uh, the co-dimension two area functional. If it were the co-dimension two area functional, then we would just see the sum of the multiplicities of these zeros. We would just see something like sum of absolute value of kappa j. Instead, here we're getting the sum of their multiplicities squared. 
Okay, and that's that's a real phenomenon. That's not just that's not something that's conjectured to be false. It's easy to find examples where that's uh, that's true. Okay, so somehow uh, because we're not really getting uh, the co-dimension two area functional here, we're getting uh, something that's really measuring the energy of these singular S1 valued harmonic maps. Okay, so it's it has this interesting relationship with co-dimension two uh, generalized minimals of manifolds, but um, it's not really a regularization of the co-dimension two area functional in the same way that the Allen Kahn is for co-dimension one. Okay, uh, so what does work? And for that, we have to go to the, uh, the gauge theory world. Okay. So that brings us to these self dual U of one Yang Lustig's functions. Okay, so we're going to let L uh, sitting over our manifold be some Hermitian line bundle. Right, so there's just going to be a family of uh, two planes over, uh, real two planes over M, right, equipped with some metric structure and some orientation. And in fact, for everything we're talking about today, uh, it's fine just to take L to be C cross M, so just a trivial bundle, the copy of C sitting over M. Right, so by a section of that bundle, you just mean a smooth map into L, sending each point X and M to some uh, one of the fiber sitting over X. Right, so in particular, for the case of the trivial bundle, this is just going to be some U of X of the form V of X comma X, right, for some complex valued map V. So by a Hermitian connection on L, or a metric connection, we just mean some first order differential operator sending sections uh, to one form of 10 to the sections, which is just giving a notion of directional derivative. Right, so sending U to not be U, and that metric connection condition, that Hermitian connection, is telling us that we respect the inner product structure in the sense that if we take D of the inner product of two sections, we can write that as nabla U composed of W plus that U inner product of nabla W. Okay, just this to satisfy the Leibniz rule with respect to the metric. All right, so uh, moreover, if we're looking again at just this uh, trivial bundle, then every Hermitian connection turns out to be given by uh, something of the form D, where D is just the usual uh, derivative on complex valued maps minus I alpha, uh, where alpha is just some one form, okay, depending affine linearly on novel. In general, if we were looking with some uh, more complicated bundle, right, this would be a one form with values in subspace. Okay, so the failure of a connection to commute with itself is uh, measured by this curvature, right, so two form of values in the endomorphisms of that bundle, so nabla uh, bracketed with nabla. And in the setting of Hermitian line bundles, uh, the curvature turns out to be a really simple object, right? So in particular, if we're writing nabla as d minus i alpha for some one form alpha, then the curvature f nabla um, can be identified just with the two form d alpha, just the usual exterior derivative. Okay, so because we're working in the setting of u of one bundles, uh, the curvature is just a linear operator on our, uh, on our connection. All right, so given a section of the bundle and some Hermitian connection on the bundle and some parameter epsilon greater than zero, we have these self-dual U of one yang Stig's energies, which are looking now like, uh, so we're feeding U of Nabla, and we get the Dirichlet energy of U with respect to that connection that we're choosing, plus this Yang-Mills term, epsilon squared times the norm, norm of that curvature two form squared, plus this potential we were seeing before, this one over four epsilon squared, one minus norm of U squared squared, we're penalizing U for failing to be a unit section, for failing to have uh, norm one everywhere. Okay, and up to rescaling the metric, this corresponds to taking uh, you know, just the epsilon equals one energy and rescaling the metric by some factor. Okay. So Daniel, can yeah. I ask just a quick question, just for my curiosity? So um, the the potential here is um, uh, so it's it's related, it's strictly related to the structure, or you are allowed, to, or, or as in Allen can some flexibility on the potential? You know, on on Allen can you can you are not required this function, this specific function, but I think that in this case, which is also the strength of your, of the, of the structure you are using, right? So the, the W here is really specific, right? For this specific. So that's, that, that's a good point, which I was going to bring up later, right? So for the, the Allen Kahn, as, as Antonio is noticing, um, a lot of the features like the relationship with minimal hypersurfaces, it's not important that you be the specific double well potential, but anything with a similar structure, right? So having two minima, you know, two strict minima, and then some kind of W outside of it. Uh, for these guys, um, the precise form of the potential is going to be very important. In a little while later, we're going to see sort of why that is. So it's related to the specific structure. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. So in, in particular, if you just uh, made that, you know, half, you know, if you change that one quarter to a half or something, already that would break some of the symmetries that are going to be important for us later. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. So we have these uh, these gauge theoretic functionals, and it turns out these have been studied for a long time. Uh, in the gauge theory literature, and we'll talk about some of the results there. But uh, 
But first, let's look at just a few basic properties. OK, so if we have an absolute minimizer. So for the Allen Kahn, our absolute minimizers were just constant functions of plus or minus 1. For the Ginzburg-Landau, they were constant functions set, uh, taking us to some unit vector in the plane. Right? Now, if we have a, a zero energy solution, it's going to tell us that the, this section u is going to be constant with respect to that connection. So with respect to the chosen connection, uh, the curvature of that connection is constant, or a zero rather, or flat. And uh, our section has to be a unit section. Right? So a, a zero energy pair is going to be something consisting of a unit section, um, a connection which views that section as parallel, and uh, the curvature has to vanish. And in fact, it's an easy exercise to use the first two conditions of flat okay. All right, so in particular, suppose we have one pair satisfying the above. So for instance, we can just take u of x to be the given by the uh, constant section sending us to the you know, constant map to 1 in the complex plane, and then take knobble just to be the usual uh, derivative on complex valued maps. Well, then for any S1 valued map, um, which we can view as a family of rotations of our bundle, right? Well, we can pick u tilde to just be uh, multiply our given section by phi, right? That gives us a new unit section. And moreover, if we make this change of connection, nabla tilde is nabla minus i times the gradient one form of that S1 valued map, then it's easy to see that uh, this pair in nabla tilde u tilde uh, also vanishes. Okay, so, uh, and in particular, this, uh, the curvature also vanishes. So this gives us another zero energy pair. All right, so the point is, well, for the Ginsburg-Landau functionals, the problem we are running into, or one of the main problems we were running into when we were trying to make it a, uh, an approximation of the co-dimension two area functional, is that it really wanted to be about the Dirichlet energy of S1-valued maps. For these functionals, there is no such thing as S1-valued maps, because all S1-valued maps look the same up to a change of gauge, up to choosing our connection well. Okay, so that's an important moral point in the difference. Right, so what we're noting here is just the, the gauge invariance of these functionals. Right, so in particular, um, right, these point-wise, these terms nabla u squared, f nabla and u squared, they're gauge invariant, in the sense that if we make this change, u tilde is phi times u, and nabla tilde is nabla minus i times the gradient one form um, for any S1-valued map, uh, these are going to be, uh, uh, you know, that, that change won't be seen by the energy function. Okay, we're just somehow rotating everything uh, in the bundle. Okay. So if we denote now by uh, omega of this, uh, the real value two form associated with our curvature, then we have these uh, Euler-Lagrange equations characterizing the, the critical points of these functionals. Okay. And uh, in two dimensions, these have been studied for a while. And in particular, for bundles over a Riemann surface, um, it was observed by Bogo Moni several decades ago that minimizes these functionals on non-trivial bundles satisfy a first order system called the vortex equations, right? So similar to how, you know, in four dimensions, uh, certain Yang-Mills problems reduced to these one dimensional equations, these instanton equations. Uh, these, these guys have this interesting uh, uh, reduction in 2D where the minimizers are gonna look like, uh, let's see, so U is gonna satisfy some kind of holomorphicity condition or anti-holomorphicity condition with respect to Nabla. And uh, the curvature two form, well, of course, a two form in, uh, on a surface we can identify as just a function, and that function is gonna be exactly plus or minus the square root of our potential term, okay? And this epithet self-dual refers to the symmetries of the functional which lead to this reduction. And those are gonna rely on the precise structure. So that's part of the answer to Antonio's question about how important the structure is. So having this first order reduction, that's something that's special to, uh, to these constants, okay? So in his doctoral work back in the uh, 80s, uh, Cliff Taubes showed that all, all finite energy critical points of these functionals for the trivial bundle over the plane, okay, so in two dimensions now, but we're working over all of R2, all critical points are in fact going to satisfy the vortex equations. They're going to be somehow minimizers with respect to some boundary data at infinity. And moreover, they're determined up to gauge equivalence, uh, so up to multiplication by one of these uh, uh, S1 value maps B by the zero set. So um, there's going to be a unique solution satisfying this first order reduction uh, with respect to its zero set. Moreover, uh, any possible zero set, so any collection of points in the plane equipped with some multiplicities can arise as the zeros. And moreover, the, the energy of the, the critical points associated with those zero sets uh, is gonna be exactly two pi times the multiplicity of those zeros. So here again, we see an important difference with the cartoon I showed you for the complex Ginsburg-Landau case, 
where in two dimensions, our energy is just somehow measuring the multiplicity of the zero set without any weird interaction terms and without somehow weight, weighting different multiplicities in different special ways. Okay. All right, so in the 90s, uh, Hong, Yos, and Struve looked at the asymptotic analysis as epsilon goes to zero for solutions of these first order vortex equations uh, over closed Riemann surfaces. Okay, and they showed the following. They showed that as epsilon goes to zero, these curvature two forms, again, now just functions since we're in two dimensions, right? They're going to converge distributionally to a finite sum of Dirac masses, representing the first Chern class of that bundle. And that's going to be supported on the limit of the zeros uh, of these uh, sections. And moreover, outside of that uh, limit of those zero sets, this u epsilon is going to approach a unit section, and novel epsilon becomes flat in the limit. So outside of our, our energy concentration set, um, we don't have somehow anything else going on. We're just seeing this uh, unit section and a connection with use it as constant. So here again, we see a nice parallel with the uh, the Allen Kahn setting, where outside the energy concentration set, everything looks trivial. Okay. And so in the, the first part of my work with Alessandro Pigotti, we carry out the asymptotic analysis for general critical points, not just these special uh, reduced equations, right? On the uh, line bundles over an arbitrary base manifold. Okay, so now we're looking at the arbitrary dimension as well. And we get something which looks uh, quite similar to what Hutchinson and Tonagawa found uh, for the Allen Kahn equation of co-dimension one. So if we have some critical points of these energies on a Hermitian line bundle, which again, we can just take to be trivial, uh, over a closed oriented manifold, and if we have a uniform energy bound as epsilon goes to zero, then these energy measures are going to converge subsequentially to a stationary now integral i minus two varifold. So it's going to have integer densities supported on the Hausdorff limit of the zero sets. Okay. And moreover, to sort of mirror that result of Hong Yost but we note that the, uh, the n minus two currents dual to the curvature two forms, right? So any two forms we can uh, identify with n minus two currents because we can wedge with an n minus two form and integrate. Uh, those are going to converge to an integral n minus two cycle uh, lying along that minimal submanifold that we're producing in the energy concentration limit. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, so here the mass of gamma is uh, the same as the mass of the integral so of the integral varifold no so that uh, so I guess the written here is the the measure associated with gamma the mass measure is dominated by the mass measure of that varifold ah okay yeah the, that was oh no no sorry okay ah, okay okay no no yeah it's written there okay so it's uh, okay you expect in particular you, you can you expect to find situations where you have uh, cancellation for that gamma guy but the as measure you have uh, Okay, okay. So in principle, you don't expect uh, the, the, that those two coincide, so. So, mor so morally, it's, just, it's like, uh, you know, having a, looking at the limit of a family of currents, right? So the, uh, um, so we think about the, the, these curvature, the curvature two forms as tracking what's happening on the level of currents, mm -hmm. right? But then the, the energy measure of tracking what's happening on the level of variables. Okay, so yeah, so the, the limit is not coinciding with the, the limit of currents. No, okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Good question. All right, so we're able to get this, this uh, a nice analog of the hutchinson tonegawa result in co-dimension one. And uh, so obviously, as you can imagine, the proof requires some pull-up analysis, uh, but the starting point is a, a pretty simple one. So um, for the allen kahn equations, um, kind of the key first ingredient was an observation of, uh, for analyzing general critical points, is an observation of Motika back in the, uh, the 80s, which tells us that if we have a solution of some uh, semilinear uh, elliptic equation of the form of the allen kahn so critical point of some du squared plus w of u, where w is any non-negative potential. Then in fact, you can get a pointwise bound in that case of the Dirichlet term by the potential term, okay? And that ends up giving you this, uh, this incredibly useful result for uh, these semilinear elliptic equations where you can improve some kind of a priori energy growth. So a priori, you can say that your uh, energy should grow like r to the n minus two over balls of radius r. But having this bound allows you to improve that to an r to the n minus one. That's telling you that the energy growth of these solutions to these Allen Kahn equations matches the energy growth of your minimal hypersurfaces. Okay. Well, we find something analogous in our setting. So if we have critical points for these functionals e epsilon over a base manifold with the, uh, okay, so say positive curvature operator, but without the curvature assumption, the same thing will hold up to some small errors. Then we get this inequality between the gang mills part of the integrand and uh, this potential term. Okay, so very much analogous to what we find for the, uh, the Modica's estimate here. All right. And proving this is just an exercise in, you know, Bachner bits and Bach formulas and maximum principle. 
once you know what to look for, that's not, uh, you know, not, not a hard thing to find. But what does it do for us? It does the same kind of thing. So if we're looking at GSS, it falls radius r, then uh, standard computations up to some errors from the curvature of our manifold that we can ignore tell us that if we look at DDR of the energy of this critical point on the ball of radius r, and that's going to be bounded below by 1 over r times the integral of the ball, so this n minus 2 times the Dirichlet term, plus n minus 4 times our yang nulls term, plus n times our potential term. Okay. Now, uh, a priori, it's easy to conclude then that uh, all of this is bounded below by n minus 4 times the energy over that uh, divided by r, right? And for critical points of a typical yang nulls higgs type functional or yang nulls type functional, that's the best one can say. So if you're looking at yang nulls problems in general, what you expect is this co-dimension 4 type energy growth. Okay? But for these guys, because we have that nice pointwise bound for f nabla in terms of the uh, potential, we can borrow in this n minus 4 times the yang nulls term plus n times the potential term. But we can borrow 2 from that potential term and see that this is all bounded below by n minus 2 times the uh, sum of those terms. And so in particular, this tells us that energy is growing. Uh, like R to the n minus 2. So we have co-dimension 2 energy growth matching what we expect for minimal manifolds of co-dimension 2. And that's really uh, the, the starting point for everything. So uh, we get that, and then together with some exponential decay of energy away from an O of epsilon neighborhood of the zero set. So as in the Allen Kahn cartoon, the whole party is happening uh, in this epsilon neighborhood around the, uh, the zero set. Uh, then we can use Taubes' results about the two-dimensional model solutions um, to get this, uh, finally put all this together and see that we get uh, convergence of energy to the stationary integral n minus 2 variable. Okay. So uh, this statement about convergence of curvatures, so I was saying this somehow tracks behavior at the level of currents, um, comes from a pretty straightforward comparison of uh, the curvature two forms to these two forms, j of u nabla acting on x and y, that shouldn't be a defined there, apologies for the typo, uh, is the following. So we just get this kind of... Uh, Jacobian type term uh, modified by this one minus norm u squared times the curvature. Okay. And the point is then by a simple application of the Cauchy Schwartz, right, it's easy to see that this uh, J of u nabla, its norm is bounded pointwise by the Dirichlet energy uh, plus the, these two are going to be bounded by this epsilon squared Yang mill squared plus one over four epsilon squared times potential squared. So, in particular, the, the norm is bounded pointwise by our, uh, our energy integrand independent of epsilon. And uh, then we just observe that this two form differs from the curvature two form by d of something which is going to be vanishing weakly as epsilon goes to zero. Okay, and that gives us the convergence of, uh, of those n minus two currents. Okay. So uh, of course this would only be fun if we had lots of examples to play with, but fortunately we do. Okay, so in particular we can show that on any Hermitian line bundle over any manifold, there's going to exist a non-trivial family of critical points uh, with these uniform energy bounds. Um, and in particular with uniform energy bounds from below as well, which are going to be converging to a non-trivial stationary integral n minus 2 variable. Okay. So, uh, and in particular, if we apply this to the trivial bundle, which exists over any manifold, this gives us an alternative proof uh, of this existence result of Omgren, where we're, again, we replace some kind of awkward GMT construction with a nice kind of clean uh, PDE analysis. Okay. So the idea for non-trivial bundles is, uh, as with the uh, non-trivial homology classes in the GMT setting, we can just minimize, right? So we uh, minimize energy in that case to get our, uh, our solutions. For the trivial bundle, uh, we employ a simple two-parameter min-max procedure. And uh, morally, the point here is that these functionals E epsilon are going to satisfy nice polite snail conditions and are amenable to sort of classical min-max techniques. And in particular, um, the somehow the moduli space of pairs where the section is non-zero modded out by the action of this gauge group of S1-valued maps has essentially the same topology, at least at the level of homotopy, as the space of n-2 cycles. So in fact, we have a rich topology to play with uh, to do more theoretic constructions. Okay. Um, so more recently, uh, with Davide Parisi and Alessandro Pagatti, we've been filling in another piece of this dictionary between these functionals and the, uh, the mass of n-2 cycles, where we're kind of going back to the, the 70s for the Alan Kahn uh, world and developing this gamma convergence theory in the spirit of what Modig ben Mortola did for Alan Kahn. So understanding not just how critical points converge to critical points, but how the variational theory for these functionals actually converges to the variational theory of the co-dimension two mass function. And uh, okay, so in particular, we show that for any family of section and connections, not necessarily solutions of any PDE, satisfying a uniform bound with respect to these energies, 
then the connections, the sections are going to converge subsequentially to some singular unit section, right? Whose singularity is going to be um, given by some co-dimension two integral cycle, which is again given by the limit of these gauge invariant Jacobians that we looked at for the uh, for this latter statement about convergence of curvatures in the previous theorem. All right, and moreover, we can show that uh, any integral n minus two cycle can be obtained in this way. So we can find the sequences of sections and connections which converge to it. And um, in particular, we can use this to, uh, well, first of all, it tells us the minimization problems for these functionals are going to converge to minimization problems uh, for the n minus two area. But moreover, we can use this to see that the, uh, the min-max verifolds um, constructed by Almgren are gonna have uh, mass bounded from above at least by the uh, verifolds arising from these min-max for the U of one Higgs functionals. Okay, so we're getting some strong results telling us that the variational theory converges, uh, the variational theory of the n minus two max functional as well. Okay, and uh, I think that's all I wanna say for now. Thanks again. So thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for the, for the beautiful talk. Um, are there any questions the, from the audience for Daniel? Uh, in the meanwhile, if uh, yeah, if, in the meanwhile you think about it, so I have some a, a, a question or two, Daniel. So um, the first thing is that uh, so in this in this family of the min max you have, so in this family of section you have for the min max. Uh, uh, okay, I think that this is it's it's cool, it's pretty sharp. But in case let's say you even knew beside the bound on the energy, you knew some bound on the on the Morse index, let's say uniform bound. On the Morse. So, do you think it's hopeful to try? One could refine a bit your the theorem uh, uh, in terms of regularity or some more information, or it's so certainly yeah that you would you would hope to try to say something more about the, the structure of the variables given this information on Morse index, right? Yeah. So, um, let's see. Short term, I'm not super optimistic about that. Um, the place to start is looking at classification of stable entire solutions of these PDEs in say R3, R4, and so on, right? So if you can show that you just sort of get the nice model solutions for stable guys in that case, then that's telling you what you're getting under blowups, uh, the general setting under you know, uniform Morse index bounds. Um, and then you can start to refine a little bit what you can say about the structure of a singular set. Now, certainly a priori, I would still expect the same kind of branch point singularities you see, um, you know, for, uh, the GMT setting in co-dimension two, right? Mm -hmm. So some others, there's no getting around the fact that you're going to have to deal with, um, you know, singularities uh, arising from things like these algebraic varieties and stuff. And let's see. Yeah, so I, I guess I'll leave it there. The, the first thing to do is look at these stable model solutions. And if you can refine a little bit of that, that'll be useful. So, but you think that anyway, there is some room to work on that. So there is some room to hope that- one... Yeah, there, there, there's natural directions to play with. And the other question that I, I wanted to ask, so uh, with this approach, it actually is super cool. So uh, it's super nice, the, the, the results. So, but could you, could you apply it also to like, if you want to now uh, approximate the bracket law, like Ala Ilman and uh, as he was doing with uh, Allen Kahn. So if you want to do the same with uh, a, and, well, co-dimension two uh, uh, yeah. flow, or for instance, if you want even like a network and having like, I guess in this case, you can get what three chambers. So can, can you make approximation of the black bracket flow with your method? So the question is more like, do you think that this monotonicity that you get can be also in, uh, transferred to a monotonicity of the whisk and type in the vectorial? Yes. So in particular, that's actually an ingredient in the, uh, the new paper with uh, Davide and Alessandro. Is uh, uh, when we're doing, when we're yeah. doing these min-max comparisons, one of the things we want to do is, you know, starting from some arbitrary min-max family for these functionals, we end up wanting to tame it by the gradient flow of these functionals um, to get some kind of uniform control on the energy density. And to do that, we, we introduce precisely um, this squeeze type monotonicity for co-dimension two. And the, the mechanism there looks a lot like these, uh, you know, this, this modica type estimate we had in a stationary case. You just have a parabolic version of that. And from there, you get the uh, Huygens monotonicity type result. So yeah, actually, so that's that's great. So it seems that it's yeah, it seems, it seems pretty, pretty optimistic for getting a, a good you know, bracket flows coming through this. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. So thank you very much for answering my question. And uh, in the meanwhile, are there other questions from the audience for uh, for Daniel? Okay. So if not, thanks again, Daniel, for the beautiful talk. Thank you for having me. And uh, yes. So for everyone else, we meet at the next. PD seminar, 
um, uh, that is next Thursday. And uh, yeah, so I stop the recording now. And then if you want, we can chat a bit more before you leave. Just let me close the recording.